let us continue with the discussion of the FTNMR spectrometer we introduced in the last class. So just to have a recap, I have this the, some summary of this FTNMR spectrometer in this slide. So that new elements in the FTNMR spectrometer, first thing is the computer because everything is computer controlled now. Now we have to be precise with respect to the timing of the pulses, the control of the pulses and the various other aspects of, uh, of the pulses as we will see uh, many, many times in, in due course. And the delays have to be properly adjusted, have to be controlled because we have to say we have to give a pulse of 10.2 microseconds and things like that. And then the data processing is an integral part of the FTNMR spectrometer because it is a Fourier transformation which is one of the important elements and there are many others related to that. Then the data storage, the storage is in the binary form in the computer. So a lot of things keep added as a result of this change in the spectrometer structure. An important element which we also mentioned is the high power transmitter. The pulse has to have high amplitude. The RF for the pulse has to be very high amplitude because we saw in order that the pulse is exciting a whole range of frequencies and the effective field is along the H1 field which is the RF amplitude. The amplitude has to be much more than the entire spectral range omega i minus omega naught. Omega naught is the RF frequency, omega i is the frequency of a particular signal in your spectrum and for the whole range of i's this condition has to be satisfied then only your effective field will be along the H1 then you can rotate the entire magnetization about the axis of the RF. So that requires a very high power. This is unlike what is there in the slow passage experiments where this amplitude is very very small. Remember this uh, gamma square H1 square T1 T2 has to be much much large smaller than 1 for the saturation to be avoided. But here that is not the case you excite all the spins in one go and that is achieved by using a very high power uh, H1. And then you have this signal which comes is actually an analog signal. The data you collect, the, you detect the Y component or the X component of the magnetization, it is collected in a, a digitized manner because signal comes in an analog fashion all right. It is in FID, the free induction decay is a continuous uh, signal. However, if it has to be stored in the computer, it has to be stored in a digitized manner. So we digitize the signal and we collect data points at regular intervals of time. Say, say we have time between two points is 1 by tau and each of these tau points is put in the in a digitized form and here is the data which is put in the digitized form and this is in the binary form. So you have various bits here we saw this is called as the analog to digital converter and it has certain, certain number of bits and it is stored in each of these bits. So it, for example you can have 101010 or 111111 that is those are the binary uh, points and this is called as the analog to digital converter. In briefly it is also called as ADC and once the data is converted into the digitized form it is put in the computer in as a word. Each point here goes as a word in the computer and when you add the words for signal averaging then of course each of these points gets added again and again and again the signal averaging happens in the computer. Then you have filters, the filters we will see in the next slide and filters are used to filter out unwanted spectral excitations and detection systems. And the receiver is the one which actually collects the data and we have uh, phase sensitive detectors which collect either the X component of the magnetization or the Y component of the magnetization. Okay. Now let us turn to some practical aspects of 50 NMR spectra. As we said earlier the pulse, pulse excitation is, is the generation of a whole lot of frequencies in one go and this is achieved by applying the RF for a very short period of time and this is of the order of microseconds, few microseconds. If the width of this is tau then we will say the, it will excite the frequencies in this particular fashion, this is the excitation profile of the RF pulse, these are Fourier related. So whole range of frequencies are excited with the different amplitudes and uh, omega naught is the RF frequency and at this point it is 1 by tau 
run by tau is if the tau is of the order of 1 microsecond this will be 1 megahertz okay megahertz here and a megahertz here so this covers a whole range of megahertz but however all of these will have different uh, amplitudes and therefore different powers however we do not want that sort of a thing we need to have excitation uniform excitation over the spectral range suppose your spectral range is only a small region of some 10 kilohertz or something like that which will be just a region around this and that for example we indicate here if this is the region which is region of excitation we region of your interest and uh, here it is omega naught this is my omega naught so this is the frequency which is the rf and around that rf we take a small region here and this small region which will have similar amplitudes because if i want to excite the various spins to the same level then i must have the same power applied to all of them therefore we choose a small area here and this is achieved by what are called as the filters which i mentioned in the previous slide okay these are electronic devices which allow you to filter out all the other signals which are excited by the application of the rf and we pick out only this much area so excitation at any frequency omega is proportional to the square of the amplitude of or and that is called as the power here is the amplitude which is plotted but the square of that is the power so the pulse excitation profile is to be tuned to the region of your spectral width or or the way your spect uh, how much spectral width you want accordingly one has to tune the filters okay now we know that uh, excitation happens to a certain region around the spectral width right so we said that this much area is area which we want to choose now suppose you have a carrier frequency which is here but your signal of interest lies somewhere here then what happens this signal this pin is not excited properly by this excitation uh, pulse so therefore what one has to do we will have to actually shift this omega naught to this this place otherwise what is the consequence and that we will see in the next slide here you see here if your carrier frequency which is the uh, your rf frequency put in a particular place this is the omega naught frequency here and if you put it here which is far away from the region of your interest that is then what happens is some signals are excited with this intensity some signals are excited with the lower intensity because the rf power is low here so we do not want that thing to happen we want to have a uniform excitation of all these spins and therefore we will have to shift this carrier frequency to the center of this region of of the spectrum and this is what you do so once you shift this carrier frequency from there to here then you will see the whole range is covered properly and all the spins are excited to a similar extent and you get similar intensities for all the signals and this is crucial for any quantitative evaluations of your or samples or your molecules the signals have to be uh, excited to the same extent so for uniform excitation of all the resonances it is necessary to move the carrier frequency to the region of interest and this is called as the offset okay now the next concept here is the phase of the rf pulse when you apply the rf pulse applied along the x axis it is said to have zero phase so we may apply a 90 degree x pulse or a 180 x pulse or a 270 degree x pulse what do these things do 90x pulse rotates the magnetization into the minus y axis 180x pulse inverts magnetization from the z axis to the minus z axis and the 270 degree x pulse rotates the mag z magnetization into the y axis so therefore the it becomes important to define where the uh, along which axis the pulse is applied essentially this is the phase it is the phase of the rf and and depending upon that we have we call the pulse as an 90x pulse or a 180x pulse or a 270x pulse we can also have somewhere in between you can have a phase of the pulse at 45 degrees in which case it will be somewhere in between x and the y axis and you can control that uh, all this is now possible because of the computer which will allow you to control the phase of of the rf because you remember rf is also a, an electromagnetic wave and therefore it has a certain amplitude and a phase and we can always control this by the computer so technically we say if it is a zero phase we say it is along the x axis or 180 uh, pulse along the x axis 270 along the x axis and so on likewise if you apply a pulse along the y axis 
then it is said to have a 90 degree phase. So, like therefore, we can have a 90 y pulse, a 180 y pulse or a 270 degree y pulse. Now, if you do the same thing uh, with a 180 degree phase means we apply it along the minus x axis, then we write it as 90 minus x, 180 minus x, 270 minus x and so on and so forth. Often you will see a different kinds of nomenclatures used in the literature or in books people may write it as 90x or y or minus x or minus y, but sometimes they may also use it as 0, 90, 180, 270 and so on. So, all of these mean the same thing and this is the correlation between the phase of the RF pulse and on which axis the pulse is applied. Okay. Now, what happens as a consequence of this? Let us begin looking at the uh, generation of the FID once more we have the initial magnetization along the z axis equilibrium magnetization and now you apply uh, 90 degree pulse along the x axis. So, therefore, as I said before the 90 x pulse rotates the magnetization to the minus y axis okay. and after that you collect the FID, you collect the FID. What do you get? Now, the magnetization is recovering back to equilibrium by rotating in this manner it is a spiral way, it goes in the spiral way and eventually it will reach to the z axis. So, while it is doing so, you are collecting the x and the y components in your receivers. So, the detector along the y axis, let us say how will the FID look like? So, this magnetization is maximum here, okay, when it is here, the x component of the magnetization is 0. So, if I look at the y component of the magnetization as it is moving and recovering it follows this sort of a pattern. There is also decay, there is a transverse relaxation decay happening and therefore, the FID decay is like this. In this of course, the decay is not written, but the, there will be an exponential factor which causes the decay here. This is the frequency component which is written here. So, exponential decay will happen at this point and therefore, you will have the signal going like this. So, we may want to uh, add that here to indicate the decay as well. So, here if you multiply this by e to the minus t by t2 and here also we multiply e to the minus t by t2, this is the transverse relaxation here and this allows for the decay of the signal. So, when you do that the magnetization collected along the x axis starts. So, in this case the magnetization starts from here and it goes down to 0 and then it oscillates in this manner. But look at the y x component of the magnetization and this starts from 0 because initial point x component is 0 and then as it moves along here then this picks up and then it goes in the sine wave here as in this manner and also it will be decaying because of the exponential minus t, t by t2 factor. We can apply various kinds of pulses along with the different phases and let us look at what it results in terms of the spectrum. If I apply 90 minus x it comes along to the y axis, if I apply a y pulse it comes along to the x axis, if I apply 90 x pulse which goes to the minus y axis as we indicated earlier. Now, what will be the nature of the FID in these cases? I am detecting the y component. So, this uh, FID goes in this manner in the same way as I indicated before, but here the signal goes in this manner as I indicated before and here what happens? This is the x pulse, this goes from minus uh, y and it goes in this manner. So, this is exactly 180 degrees out of phase with respect to this. So, this is the way it goes in this manner. Now, if I were to fully transform this signal, so I get an absorption signal in this manner which has maximum intensity. You remember in one of the Fourier transform theorems, the first data points essentially is the integral of the spectrum and here the first data point is the maximum, it is positive, this it gives you the total integral of the spectrum, this is the integral of the spectrum which is positive which is greater than 0. In this case when the signal is collected in this manner, it starts from 0 here f of 0 is equal to 0 and this produces a dispersive signal and the integral of dispersive signal is 0. This half and this half are opposite in sign and therefore, this goes to 0. And here when it starts from the negative side obviously, it will have a negative integral and this goes in this manner and f of 0 is less than 0. So, therefore, we call this as signal phase. 
if I call this as 0 phase, this is 90 degree phase and this is 180 degree phase. So this is the relation between the RF phase and the signal phase and the FID phase, all these things are correlated in some manner. Okay. Now with regard to the detection, what kind of frequencies we get when we actually collect the data and Fourier transform? Suppose we collected the cosine component only, we call that as the single channel detection. So now if it is a cosine component which is getting detected, so then my FID is cosine omega t right and this FID is going like this as we saw. Now when I Fourier transform this what do I get? Now if you remember cosine omega t can be written as cosine omega t is equal to the e to i omega t plus e to the minus i omega t divided by 2. Therefore there are two frequencies here plus omega and minus omega and therefore when I Fourier transform this I will get two signals and if this is plus omega this will be minus omega and that is what is indicated this slide here. So I have here when I do Fourier transformation if it is a cosine function it is a sort of signal and I will have two frequencies omega i and minus omega i and this is called as a single channel direction. If I were to detect x component of the magnetization this is for the y component, if I were to detect x component this will have also plus omega and minus omega but they will have dispersive phases like this one like this and the other one like that. So they will have also plus and minus frequencies in the same phase. So this is indicated here. Now if I were to detect both of the components mx and the my components and this is called as quadrature detection. Okay. Now quadrature detection y component is giving me these two frequencies as plus omega and minus omega, mx component is giving you again two frequencies but notice however that I have written here is absorbed to signals but this comes as a result of phase correction. After I do a certain 90 degrees phase correction on the dispersive signals which we collect with the mx component then I get this absorptive phase because there is the between the absorptive phase and the dispersive line shape there is only 90 degrees phase shift. So I add this 90 degrees phase shift then I will get this negative here and this positive here. Then what I do is I add these two frequencies this is mx plus mi both are collected these are collected separately in uh, Fourier transformation and then added then you get you have uh, cancellation happening of these two components whereas this one survives and therefore I will have only one signal present here the another signal is removed because this signal was an artifact of Fourier transformation. This was not really present in your spectrum it was an artifact of Fourier transformation we do not want that. So therefore we have to remove it and we have to fall for that we have to do this separately we will have to collect both the components separately Fourier transform them and do a phase correction on one of those components and when you add it this removes this component and you will have uh, a proper signal at, at the desired place. This is called as quadrature detection. Now uh, and therefore this allows discrimination of positive and negative, negative frequencies. So if I have the uh, offset carrier frequency at one place then this will allow me to discriminate whether I have a uh, signal at, on the right side of it or on the left side of it and because the right side and the left side they will be called as positive and negative frequencies and they will be discriminated when we have a quadrature direction. If I want to call this as positive frequency this is negative frequency and if these are real present in your sample then you will be able to de dis discriminate them using quadrature detection. But sometimes some artifacts appear. What are these artifacts? So let me also write that here. Artifacts are called as quadrature images. So we said that this is signal and I will have a signal like this the axis when I add this this will go and I will have only signal like this. But this assumes that these two signals are exactly identical because these are collected with the two different receivers one is along the y axis other one is along the x axis. Suppose there is a mismatch 
between these two receivers and the signal amplitude here is not the same as the signal amplitude here then it will produce a small glitch here and some and which which does not have any particular phase or anything like that and this is called as quadrature image. Okay. And this has to be removed and this there are of course techniques to remove this kind of uh, glitches and these quadrature images are not desirable in your uh, spectrum. So that is a special feature of Fourier transform NMR and then we have the next thing that comes out is what is called a signal digitization and sampling. We said the signal has to be sampled and uh, at regular intervals of time. So, this is the we collect a data point here, a point here, a point here and so on and so forth at regular intervals. The time between two successive points is called as the dwell time okay. and suppose I want to represent it as tau but do not confuse this with the pulse width which also we said earlier as tau but you can well you can call the pulse width as tau p if one likes but this is uh, now at the moment this is the dwell time what we are talking about. So, this is the time between two consecutive points is the same between every two points. Now, how do we decide what should be this dwell time? Okay. Now, this is determined by what is called as the Nixt theorem. Now, what is the Nixt theorem? This states that to represent a sine or a cosine wave precisely by digital points, there must be at least two points per cycle of the wave. So, if I have a full cycle of the wave, if I have a wave going like this, in that way there must be at least 2 points so that that is properly represented and that is called as the next theorem and therefore what frequency we should uh, therefore uh, sample therefore the dwell time is selected to suit the largest frequency in the spectrum. If omega max is the largest frequency in my spectrum then I must collect at the rate of 2 omega max because 2 points per cycle means 2 omega max should be the uh, should be the frequency that should be the rate. So, that many points I must collect per second that is the that is the rate and this is called as the next frequency. Therefore, tau becomes equal to 1 by 2 times omega max. Okay. So, if I choose this naturally every other frequency which is smaller than this will have more than 2 points. Therefore, every frequency will obviously be represented in this kind of a uh, choice. So, you choose your frequency to suit to the largest frequency in your spectrum. If I collect these many points then naturally I will be collecting more points for each of the frequencies. Well, to explicitly uh, show it let me indicate to you how. So, if I have a FID which is going with a frequency like this. Okay. And this is the last this is the particular frequency called as let us say omega 1 and I have points here at least 2 points per cycle 1, 2, 3. So, this is the largest frequency let me say I am collecting 2 points per cycle. Then I have another frequency which goes let us say like this. Okay. So, now how many points I have per cycle from here to here I will have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so 7 up to so many points I have. So, any, any smaller frequency I will have, I will have a larger number of points to represent it. Therefore, since the data is collected as a result of the sum of all of these frequencies, so each point therefore represents all the frequencies correctly. Therefore, choose the largest frequency for to define your uh, sampling rate. That is my uh, uh, sampling uh, rate. And accordingly, I will choose the spectral widths. So, now another important feature that happens here is what is called as the folding of signals. The sampling theorem poses a difficulty that one has to know the frequency range in the spectrum even before collecting the data because you a priori you do not know where your frequencies are and then how to place the frequency, how to place your carrier, where to place the carrier. So, how to choose the offset? that is often a difficult problem. So, therefore, you can always end up choosing a wrong offset or a wrong filter and then you may not be able to cover your proper spectral range. In such a situation what happens is the signals which are outside your spectral region get folded into your region of interest, they appear with a different phase and this is a phenomenon known as folding of signal. 
the sampling theorem poses the difficulty that one has to know the frequency range in the spectrum even before collecting the data. And this is not an easy thing to do and we can get into troubles if the choice is not proper. Okay. Any error in the choice of the sampling rate vis a vis the chosen offset causes the so called folding of the signals. And this is illustrated here typically that suppose I have a spectral region which I have selected here. What I mean is I selected here then I applied my filter so that I select only this much region of my spectrum compared to the offset. The offset is here, half of the spectral region is here, half of the spectral region is here. Therefore, the largest frequency which I have is omega max and this accordingly I will choose my dwell time. right? So now if this is not proper that some frequencies are left out for example this one if it is left out then it turns out that this fellow will fold into this region at this point and this is called as the folded signal and this appears as a result of some uh, digitalization problems which we will discuss in the next class in greater detail. This is the consequence of folding, this is the, this is the consequence of some wrong choice of the uh, dwell time and uh, wrong choice of the spectral weight or the filters which we are giving for the uh, data collection. Okay. So, this one for digitization is, is indicated here and uh, folding of the signals happens as a result of this and we will continue with the folding of the signals in the next class. Thank you.